It was a warm, sunny day in early May. June and Bill were going home from school. They were wondering how to spend the afternoon. Should they bicycle to Lookout Pass in the hills outside of town or explore the deserted fork on the riverbank? They didn't really want to do either. They realized the old games, the old explorations, they simply weren't fun or exciting anymore. Bill and June discussed this feeling as they passed the unused water station beyond the schoolyard at its high brick walls hidden by a jumble of wild bushes. Suddenly, June stopped walking. The Forces of Krill is a book set in the world of Zork and is a book in the What Do I Do Now series. This book and the other three in this series take place in the Zork universe, which, as far as I know of, started with several computer games. Games that were interactive text-based RPGs. No graphics, baby. We're getting down old-school style here. Let's get down to business. In this book, unlike Choose Your Own Adventure, you don't star as the main character. It's all about June and Bill, and as you read, you make the choices for them. Clever attempt to avoid pinning the reader into being one sex, but I still prefer actually being the character versus this idea of just making choices for others. As they both walk, they spot something shining under a bush. Upon closer inspection, they find a damn sword. Who put this here? How careless. Someone out committing a crime and ditching swords under bushes for children to find? Wait, Bill just realized it's an ancient sword of elven worksmanship. He grabs for it and June begs him to leave it be. It could be dangerous. I can have them ignore the sword and go home at this point, or I can have them pick it up. And ignoring it must be one of those ridiculous cheap endings that some of these kinds of books do in the beginning. Besides, who wouldn't want to choose to have the kids play with a sword? Bill calls June a ninny, and that alone could make this book a winner, but I'm getting presumptuous here. Bill grabs a sword, and in a flash, they're transported to another world, or they're now wearing hip tunics and leather fanny packs or some crap. They're approached by knights who refer to them as Bivitar and Geranda. What? Bivitar? It sounds like some kind of snazzy camera. Well, I'm told that their uncle Sayavar is at the campsite, and they can go there or meet an old man in the village. Ah, oh, the classic old man in the village stick, eh? Okay, I guess since I'm about as knowledgeable on this book as a teenager with a rag full of ether, I probably better just go talk to the geezer in the village. He explains that the great empire has fallen because your uncle Saivar is incompetent. Not his exact words, but I know how to judge a man's character. So now you need to get the sword and three balls of legendary power. Okay, they're actually three crystal spheres of legendary power. I just really wanted to say three balls of legendary power. I had an uncle like that. He had a really strange looking sack. We're going down a dark road here, back to the geezer. So now I'm being told they can either take the sword to their uncle in the forest or stay with the old man and hope all the bad guys just go away someday. Why is he trying to get these kids to stay with him? Holy moly. Going to the woods to meet the uncle. I just don't trust this guy. You like popsicles? They have wandered on to the campsite in the woods to meet good old Uncle Saivar, but found an extinguished fire and a note telling them to go to the house of Elrond quickly because the forces of Krill are amassing and stuff. So now I have to choose if I'd rather them go to Aragain Falls or go to Elrond's house. Why the hell would I just have them randomly wander off into the falls? What does that even have to do with this story? And then again, heading to Elrond's might be some dark ploy to rope them into Scientology, so maybe this Aragain Falls idea isn't as dumb as it sounds. I'm confounded. Sorry, I'm just gonna send the kids to the falls. Unbeknownst to me at the time, this is actually actually the point where the story makes its division between the two plot lines. On the way to the falls, Elrond comes galloping past on a horse and screams that a warlock of Krills is coming and tells the kids to follow him. Elrond then jumps off a cliff. The kids run behind and stop at the edge, and they turn and see a friendly looking, simple dressed man approaching. So should they jump off the cliff or wait and talk to this man? Hey, I'm a fan of throwing kids off cliffs, so let's make that leap into the unknown. Worst case scenario, you die and don't have to go on living with the name Bivitar or Geranda. And I can go read something else, or chop my toes off with scissors or any other activity slightly more entertaining. At the bottom is a grizzled old hermit who marvels at young love. They've just jumped from Lover's Leap, and he explains that it's a lot less messy these days since they installed the Frobaz magic anti-gravity field. Frobaz should hit up Foxconn. There's a market here. The hermit says he hasn't been out in the sunlight for 30 or so years. Must be one of these see-through bastards by this point. Thankfully, he doesn't remove his ratty shirt. His whiteness could likely detach a retina. The kids introduce themselves, and the hermit demands to know what kind of dumbass name Bivitar is. Okay, I like this guy. This guy... Fox. He introduces himself as Harlan and says he's lived here for 800 years. Okay, buddy. He offers up a boat or tells them they can walk like suckers. I suppose they take the hermit's boat. Why not? Okay, well that killed him. This is Aragain Falls after all. That would suggest a waterfall somewhere. The book says I got two out of ten points. This book has a point system and I just got two points. Like an idiot. If you take the footpath instead, you find a dam with a dark passage. You can have him continue checking out the dam, check out the passage, or listen to a frog that just appears and says to explore the stairs at the top of the dam. It says you might find the three balls of power there. Why do so many of these types of books have a random part where LSD must have been ingested? Going up the stairs leads to a control room with mysterious buttons, and Bivitar asks that he is pushes buttons, causing floods and burst pipes. In a hollow area behind a collapsed wall are those three super power zork balls you've been looking for, but the flood water 
waters rise and they vanish below. Vivitar goes after them. After a struggle and the glass in the control room exploding from the rising water pressure, our two kids are washed out into safety with the magical balls your uncle wants. They follow a path away from the dam and end up at a mine, whereupon they discover a room full of treasure. What an obvious trap that's gonna be, so I'm just gonna have them walk away and wander into the mine itself. They find Saivar and the rest of his gang further into the mine, and the book at this point has a glaring editing mistake whereby it repeats Saivar's dialogue. I actually thought I'd gone dumb or just tired for a second and had to reread it a couple times to try and make sense of what I'd just read, only to discover there was no sense to make. It was a mistake missed in the editing process. Or was it? Saivar is very excited to see they have the sword and all three spheres, and is really trying to get them to hurry up and hand them over. I think this was no editing mistake. Clever writing, sir. This is another trap. I'm not handing them over. My gut tells me some wicked crap is afoot here. And I was correct. It was an imposter, and Bill and June are on the run. I, I can't keep calling them Bivitar and Durandra. I just can't. Lizard warriors are hot on their heels, but it's hard to take the danger seriously when this lizard just looks happy to see him, and apparently just wants a hug. After a ride in a coal car, they wind up in the basement of a house. It's Elrond's house. Saivar sees them and calls out to Bivy T and Duran Duran. Yeah, I think I'll call him that. He touches them, and they know it's Saivar because of the way his hands feel. They don't even need to look at his ring. Indeed, I guess we've all got an uncle like that. Baller that he is, Bivy T hands over the sword, and Duran Duran points to a bulging pouch, telling Saivar they've got the balls. The forces of Krill have the house surrounded. Shit got real. Saivar mutters a spell. The balls glow. The house disappears, and everyone is now in a huge field with Krill and his forces and Saivar and the legendary warriors of Zork. A massive battle ensues. Krill fights Saivar mano y mano, and after all looks lost for Saivar, the sword finally decides to do its magic business, and Saivar stabs Krill in the heart. Everyone reappears in Elrond's living room. Saivar is like all fucked up and shit, but Elrond says it's not serious, so everybody needs to chill. The kids notice that the three balls have turned to ash, something no man ever wants to see. Saivar gives the kids a ring and tells them they can use the ring to come back whenever they want, and then in a puff of smoke, they are sent home. Bill and June wake up in some bushes, probably having to later explain to people what they were doing in said bushes, but regardless, they think the whole thing has been a dream, until they discover the ring. June accidentally calls Bill Bivitar, and then apologizes, and Bill replies, It's Bill now, but it will be Bivitar again someday. What a damn pimp. Like a standard choose-your-own-adventure book, this one does have an A story path and a B story path, and the one I took was essentially wandering a bit through some woods and then around the dam and into some mines. The other path is mainly a forest excursion and a stop at Elrond's house and then onto the caves and the dam location from the other storyline. This other branch also includes some choices that include gameplay elements like collecting items. If you choose a branch that has the kids finding a key, for instance, you will be called upon later to make a choice based on whether or not you found it. There's also an amusing path to punish any cheaters. As for the book as a whole, well, the book was meant for kids, so harsh criticism from an adult would be absurd, but in my opinion, I've enjoyed Choose Your Own Adventure or Endless Quest more than Zork. I remember thinking these Zork books were alright when I was about, you know, 11 or something, but I read three out of four of them, though, so I must not have hated them, but that probably spoke more to my fanaticism with game books rather than any love for Zork. The book itself was far too easy to get through, and nearly every choice, though not all, has one option that continues the story with the others leading to immediate endings. The illustrations were decent, and the cover art is a hoot. I assume the guy on the cover is Krill, but he looks like that heavy metal guy down the street who everyone knows sells weed. As far as the Zork games go, I've never played those, but my computer text-based gaming geek cred does have a few points on the scorecard, as I used to play on the VIC-20 console as a kid and loved these sorts of non-graphical role-playing games back then. I think if you were a fan of the Zork games, you might find something to like here, but if you've never played those and are a fan of fantasy-style game books, then Endless Quest probably offers something better. Until next time, may you have dreams of powerful balls in the hands of your sweet uncle.